I'm going to ask everybody, please mute yourself during the meeting. And please welcome Dr. Rutusi for his uh, third lecture on history of Elishism in Iran. Thank you very much. Go ahead. I start again with the same verse. Allazina amanu wa hajaru wa jahadu fi sabiyyallah wa anwalihim wa anfusihim a'zamu darajatan in the Allah wa ulaikahum al farazun. Those who believe and have left their homes, striving with their world, their lives in God's way, are of much greater worth in God's sight. Uh, these are they who are triumphant. Uh, but with the salam and then uh, with all the, I'm very happy again, I can be. Uh, joining our friends from Masjid Irshad. Uh, so this, again, I start all, a few times with this verse because I think it's very similar or explaining what happened in the uh, spread of uh, Islam or Shi Islam in Iran. And actually it has some similarities to what's happening in the US. So I'm going uh, in some explanations in a few minutes emphasizing that part more. Today, I want to discuss another part, another city, which is the city of Ray, which is south of Tehran, historically very important city. But early part, I think I'll be going to discuss some uh, introductory comments, some review, some explanation of what was before it to make it more kind of clear. And then we go forward from it. And again, what I want, what I want you to notice is that this spread uh, Islam in Iran and Shi Islam in Iran, it was not a giant step, wasn't a sudden step, was a slow process. And I think has some similarities to what has happening here. Uh, I want you to have that in mind. And then in the other side is that some, uh, uh, you would see a continuous chain too. A small step when one person, one city, cause another one from that city follows it, maybe another city and goes forward. So I'm going to a little bit clarify that it's helpful to see that. So what, 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 what is the first picture we saw, again, as I said, is the Shahri and the, Hari, uh, the Haram of Shah Abdul Azim Hassani. Uh, it was a popular and is a very popular place for uh, visiting in uh, South Tehran. And, and that actually his shrine is kind of the corner uh, or, or of the whole city. Now let's start to see what the whole, uh, these uh, talks are about. We are between two meets uh, in, in the spreading around, uh, and especially in the media and among the Iranian community, and especially some of them which are not very, uh, I mean, looking positive to Islam or Tashayi or stuff like that. One meet is that the, or, and that I think has gone to the mind of many other people too, that conversion Iranians to Islam was very early after the conquest, very sudden, very rapid, and all people converted to Islam either by sword or persuasion. But as we discussed the first lecture, this wasn't sudden. This was very gradual, essentially speed up or accelerate much later. And I'll show you again that graph too. And then the other meat, which is, uh, it seems again is spreading out. The conversion Iranian to Shia Islam again happened in time of Safavids. Again, maybe by sword or persuasion. Uh, and maybe, um, I mean, all around that time, but what we want to emphasize, the Shia Islam existed uh, in Iran much more before Saf, much much earlier before Safavi. We are not saying majority were Shias, but the Shia has a strong presence and a strong history and very ups and downs. And our focus, although mainly will be the first four centuries, uh, to the fall of Baghdad by Saljubis. That's that's a very important part, the turnaround for the whole fortune of Shia. But I, we have to see, maybe we can pick it up after that. So that's the first two things have in mind, because some of the question about Safavis, all it seems Safavid has done everything about Shiism. They were very important, but these two should be corrected. Again, I show you this curve. This is an important one it, that this is the curve of conversion of Iranians to Islam. Look, the vertical axis is the percentage. The conquest, the year of the conquest of Iran is about 25 after Hijra. And then you see it's very low. And then to the end of the Umayyads, which is, uh, is about 132, the conversion of Iranians is about 10%. And even that is picked up by much of the missionary of Abbasids in Khorasan. 
they they notice to be successful having uprising against Omayyads. They need Mawali, they need Iranian, and they wanted to convert, and it's good to convert them. As I said, the first lecture, Omayyads were not only uh, encouraging, they're always prohibiting to conversion of people to Islam. And the same strategy, uh, as I said it last time, and I'm going to review today, was used by uh, Hassan al Utrush, the Zaydish Imam in uh, Tabaristan, which a little bit later, at the end of the second century. But you see, the conversion start to pick up. And then the time of the Hijra of Imam Reza in Iran, which is about 203 after Hijra, uh, 200, yeah, 203, you see, it's 50 percent of Iranian plateaus converted. And it's the peak of it, and the time of Mamun, you know, the part you see Tahir, it's over there. And then, okay, by the time the Buyids come in power, by the time which we have the end of Kaiba to Kobra, which is about 329, then we can say Iranians are mostly converted to Islam, but not to Shi Islam, to Islam. So, so the conversion really happened much later on and actually was accompanied by Shi ideas. Because the Abbasid revolution, don't forget, was based on a Shi idea. That the slogan was Rizam in Ali Muhammad. That is, we accept the government of somebody which we agreed on from the family of the Prophet. Everybody understood this would be somebody of descendant of Imam Ali, but Abbasid, they knew uh, they have other plans, but they kept the hand second. So that's the first need, which I think I should clarify, and I did it. Then I, this is the one I want to emphasize more. The model, model of spread of Shi Islam in Iran in some aspects is similar to spread of in, in US, but some differences. There existed individual Shi'is here and there. So even you go to Idaho, Montana, you might definitely find some Shi'is. And maybe even some of those cities over there, you find some Shia center, Shia mosques, Shia Hussainians. Especially now we have more from Iraqi community, Afghani brothers and other communities. So they spread out, so we have. Uh, then, then, but definitely uh, the concentration of Shia Muslims are more in the larger cities, urban cities like Chicago, because there are more jobs, there's opportunities. But the Shia centers and mosques exist in these localities side by the side of Sunni centers. The majority of the people here are not Muslim, and actually this was the case in Iran too. As you see, the 50% cut come around, especially in the Iranian plateau, at about 200 after Hijra. So the, uh, the first 200 years, the majority are non-Muslims because Umayyads didn't care what they do and let them, the governors, do their job and send them just the money. And gradually the conversions start to pick up. The non-Muslims want to convert, have advantages uh, religiously, and they like it religiously, advantages even uh, financially, but okay, that's another story, but the, the mass conversion started and you can see picked up. Uh, so in Iran was the Zoroastrian the dominant religion, but the only difference is this, uh, the distinction, uh, uh, and also, you know, so in, in Iran, the Muslims were uh, many, many of them in Arabs, uh, and some converts to, from natives to Islam, which is the same as here. Majority of Muslims here are immigrants. Uh, we come outside. We have some converts, uh, and for uh, I mean the percentage goes up and down. In 1960s, 70s, we start to get a lot of conversion by African Americans. Maybe the balance shifted from the native conversion, but that stopped. But after assassination of Malcolm X and then the whole nation of Islam that stopped. So I think now again because of the immigration, the majority of Muslims are I think from immigrant families. And that the same was Iranian plateau. The most of the Muslims and Arabs with the Mavali or some converted people. We don't know exactly the percentage, but at the earlier stages, we know it must be the case. The, the difference is that in, in US, the, the system or the many countries is the not Muslim necessarily, but here, this is very different. We have, at least we have freedoms of religious worship, stuff like that. Uh, but then, then, okay, the rulers were Muslim. So have this in mind. And then the other factor you have to look, okay, this is the people. Uh, occasionally we have governments, uh, we can call them kingdoms, emirates, principalities, whatever you want to call them with Shi rulers, which I discussed one of them, one of the first one, one of the important one, the Zaidi one. But that Zaidi one had very interesting feature is that, uh, established in a place which was not under the jurisdiction of Muslim Arab empire, whatever you call it, Abbasid Umayyad. Tabarastan was controlled by the Gilan and 
they level wasn't under the control of uh, Islamic uh, or uh, Baghdad or Damascus government. So, so that was a unique case. Uh, the importance of these rulers, the Shi tendencies, uh, is always they were important. These, when you have a dynasty which was Shi, supporting Shi cause, usually helped a lot the conversion of people. I mean that politics and religion are very closely closely related. At, at Nasrallah Dina Mulukahem, many people are really following the religion of the rulers, their might, their power, their wealth is very influential. Umayyad used that to the benefit to develop their own Sunni Islam, Abbasid adjusted, but again, they're developed later on their own Sunni version of Islam. And it has effect, that's the, that's the fact of life and the other side. So, I mean, religious people sometimes look to the government, the rule as, 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 a, as a tool for spreading religion. And as, at the other side, government also look to the religion and to this benefit controlling people, getting the support of people. So this interaction is well known and, and maybe we can discuss it other uh, time. And then occasional, as I said, still you may get the principalities which the ruler is Shia, uh, but doesn't mean the majority of the rule are Shia because now from Islam, we pass to Shia. The, okay, the majority of Iran by end of the, the all of Iran nearly at the end of Kaiba Kobra is, uh, is Muslim but not she, she is a very minority. The same now we are here, the situation is now here. So uh, now, as we discussed last time, mass conversions happened, for example, in a place like uh, Tabaristan, De Laman, Dilan. And uh, I, I, we have to a little bit discuss this, di this dynamics of these local principalities, Emirates, to you understand what's happening after this after the third or fourth century. Uh, it starts really after, after Ma'mun. Till Ma'mun, there wasn't such a thing. Till Ma'mun, the control of the central government on the whole conquered land was uh, total. But gradually due to the war between Amin and Ma'mun, other uprising, Alawites, Kharijites and other stuff, the control weakened. And then the, the raise of Iranians and the getting power and strength of Iranians and the expansion of too much of the Empire made the local emirates get the real power. So the, from the beginning of the 10th century after Hijra, the local emirates and principalities come to existence. They were uh, they were both sides. They were rulers Sunni and Shi'i. Actually, many Iranian ones were Sunni, very hardline Sunnis. I mean, at least they show like that. They they are in political was power was they were independent. So the Tahiri and the names you hear in the history books when you study in high school, Tahiri and Safari and Samani and Ghazvini and Saljuvian. Saljuvian is important, maybe at the end we go through that uh, a little bit. Uh, but then we have occasional Shi dynasties. Uh, actually, Zaidi of Tabaristan, which we discussed, and Yemen, Fatimis of Egypt, Armatids, which are smiley, is very, really not, not good. This get very bad name to Shi as all. This called Rafizi and Armati, the nick, bad nicknames. So he still gives us to Shias are coming one from Armatis, which Armatis were not really good. And then Rafazi is okay. We, we in the sense, if we do not, we, you mean that we do not believe the first two caliphs? It's not wrong. Uh, Armatis of Bahrain and Buyids of Iran. Now, the difference is, is this I want you to be careful. The Sunni principalities, those Amis, recognize the authority of Caliph in Baghdad, at least nominally. They act as caliph agents. They we call we are caliph agents. Collected taxes, they pay him some money, royalty, and they receive legitimacy from him through the eyes of Sunni populace. Because look, from the time of the uh, the, two, the first two caliphs, at least the belief was that the ruler should be from Quraysh, which is still is there. I mean, even Abu Bakr Baghdadi claims is is Qurayshi. You know, they make a lineage all of the, except Ottoman couldn't do it. So they have to find another way. But all the rulers, and then after Abbasids, essentially even not Qurayshi, you have to be Bani Hashem. You know, the King of Jordan is Bani Hashem, King of Morocco claims I'm descended of the Prophet. So, I mean, you need to do, Saudis don't. So that's that's their problem. But so that's another uh, feature which uh, you have to in mind. So they, they uh, have to do. So this, this game was there, Caliph was there, nominally, and then uh, 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 
The hadith is used Amir, uh, but Umara from Quraysh, but essentially they understood as Caliph. Uh, and but the Shia principalities, they don't necessarily recognize the authority of Caliph in Baghdad because they don't believe the whole story. So especially Zaydis or Ismailis at all. Uh, so they usually didn't put pay any tribute, no connection, with the important exception of the Buyids, which I'm not going to discuss it today, but for the spirit of Shiism, for the whole story of Shiism, not only in Iran, Buyids are very crucial. The, the time they control Baghdad is essential. Uh, Buyid did it differently. Buyid th didn't go directly hostile to the caliphs. Somehow recognized their authority. Somehow uh, uh, give some uh, rest, uh, recognition to them. And this can be done by them because it was the age of Qaybrat al Cobra. That we will see. If it didn't happen, that could give you pragmatism, the change. Uh, 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 but the point is that the Baghdad caliphs also, they were always worried one of these come and capture Baghdad, which actually Buyids did. The first one who captured Baghdad, one of these principalities uh, conquered Baghdad was Buyids. But they start to play these emirs against each other. And, and one of these incentives always was to, uh, of, if you see there is any Alavad government, especially in the Tabaristan, sending one of those Sunni emirs, uh, to crush that government. And they promised them, if you do that, I get you that, I give you that, I make you this. So this is the game of the uh, uh, kind of uh, caliphs balance their weak power. We see some similarity with this in Europe too. I think it's good later on, after, uh, actually few centuries or just after this, there you have an emperor, technically is like caliphs. They maybe modeled it too. And then, uh, but the emperor doesn't have the religious authority, Pope has it. But besides the emperor, we have national kings. And national kings like this uh, local dynasties in the Muslim world, they are officially under the command of emperor. Uh, they have to, if he wants to summon an army, they have to listen to him. But usually you see they're already independent emperor who didn't have much money, power. Those national kings had it. And then one big difference, which we didn't have in Muslim world, emperor was elected. It's very surprising. Although not every people elected him, five or six of those emirates were electing him. And the whole concept of election, I mean, like the Shura Omar put a little, but you know, but another rulers would do. And then, but the national kings were hereditary. So this dynamics should be there. I want you to be careful about it. And then, so helps you to understand, I'm not, don't think we've had time to reach the Buyids tonight, but that's a very essential uh, to understand what happened and how the Shiism spread. But you know, these rulers very important. No matter what the what happens, uh, influence. You know, when when Shia ruler get dominant, Shia ruler get dominant in region, you uh, very often get Shiism spread. Then another Sunni comes, wiped out the Shiism, and this happened. Uh, so, and especially Shia was suffered a lot. We have to see in the history lost many of his books. Now, if you want to have a chronology, also helps you to understand it a little bit better, because we, we our goal is to discuss first fourth century a little bit to the fifth century, around 455, uh, 455. Uh, 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 so you can see if this is the good way to the first four imams of first century, the next four imams are the second century, and then effectively the next four imams or with the Ghaibat al sohra are the third century and then Ghaibat al sohra and Ghaibat al kubra start in the fourth century. So if you have this, we can we, we can match which imams are there and how things are, are uh, progressing. Now, again, what we saw last time, which I'm, I'm, I'm going to a little bit also bring that to that cycle is that we first saw centrality of Kufa and then later Baghdad, which still we haven't reached that stage. In Iraq for Shi Islam Iran, Kufa was saying every every uprising was Kufa. Every side that come from Kufa to Iran, they immigrated to Iran. So uh, much of the center of Shiism was Kufa. Imams were in Medina, but Kufa was important. Then we saw Qom, which is a very different thing: immigration of Arab Ashari tribe. Qom was like Dearborn in Michigan. Uh, I mean, Dearborn is not fully, fully 100% Shia, but it's still so strongly Shia. I mean, not only Muslim, but it's Shia Muslim. 
So Rome was like that and get the reputation, the same way Dearborn has got the reputation uh, in the United States. And then Ash'ari tribe has a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, we owe them a lot for the spread of Shizim, for the uh, for the establishment of the knowledge, for the collection of Hadiths. Then we saw the Tabaristan establishment of Zaidi government. And then we, uh, we saw over there the large convention of non-Muslim to Zaidi Shi Islam. Okay, the one which I didn't, uh, I a little bit rushed through it and I want to go a little bit more details is the uh, Hassan al-Utrush or uh, Nasser al-Latin, that's, that's important. Uh, I will briefly go through that, but we saw that the first government established from two brothers, which were Hassani, they were originally from Ray, because today we want to talk to Ray. They, they were called to go to Tabaristan, establish a government, establish a government which endured for 37 years. So you see uh, middle of third century to the close to the end of third century, but their government, and you see again to the map, and we are going back to the map too. So the government must see in Tabaristan a little bit from Daylam, not all of it, Daylam in his own independent government in Gilan, but, uh, so it's here, and then look, the ray is just outside the mountains and goes into the south, and it make an access, and you can easily see that ray could be influenced by the goal or a communication between them. It's not very far away, and more naturally also ray. Ray, we will see that uh, is a very important uh, strategic city for transportation. It's, it's a hub for going east-west of Iranian Plato, because much of it is desert, much of it is not good, so much of the roads historically going from east to west, for example, Mashhad to Tabriz or uh, other ways pass through Ray. And, and occasionally also the governments of Zaidi governments up the north had the control of Ray too. I mean, occasionally when they see there is a weakness, they come capture for a few months, few years Ray too. So that also maybe influenced Ray, but I'm not going through that. But have that map in mind. I will come back to this map again when you one more time. Now, but the one I want to emphasize, and, and, and the reason is this, look, those two brothers established their government. Uh, they did bring much Shi rule, Shi law, Shi theology, Shi hadith to the region and have connection with Yemen. But the Samanids defeated them and the uh, younger brother was uh, killed in the war. Uh, but another person, which uh, this time uh, uh, Hosseini one, Ali uh, Utrush, Hassan Al Ali ibn Utrush and Nasr al Haq restored the Shi Zaidi government. It is very important. Even Hussein Yemen's, when it comes to Iran as a delegation a few years ago, were asking the Iranian government to kind of keep, I mean, renovate his shrine and keep good care of it. They like him because this this is very respected. And as I said, uh, the Sayyid, as I said, Mortaza, two great Shi scholars, also are descendants of him. And then I want to go a little bit more about him. Why? Because I want to show if those two brothers first established a government, and then they lost it, not everything go in vain, because this next person, Hassan and Utrush, essentially was part of their government was with them. And that will happen. Look, this will happen. Somebody raised in Chicago, maybe move to Orlando, open the mosque. And the next from Orlando, maybe go to uh, North Carolina. And then who knows, maybe they have the large if scale effect somewhere in North Carolina and South Carolina. This could happen. Uh, so you have to just do and then wait for time. And the time God, if it's for the sake of God, can God multiply it? Like, you know, we have one seat become 700 seat, it will happen. Now, I, I, because the last time I rushed through it, I want to go back to it. He was originally from Medina. He had come to Tabaristan in the reign of those two brothers, Hassan and, and Muhammad ibn Zayd. He was involved in the battle. Muhammad ibn Zayd was killed by Samanids. He escaped to Ray, again Ray. So moved down the mountains. But again, the king of Daylamites, which now they become Muslim, invited him to come and uh, and help him to now he conquer Tabarissam. Why those king of Daylamats want to do that? Maybe they were worried if the Tabarissam is controlled by some governments which are Sunni and friendly with the caliphates, they will attack his kingdom. Because now he's a Muslim, but these kingdoms were never conquered by Muslim army. They first, they were not Muslims and then get Muslim, I think even Zaidi Muslim, uh, so having a buffer zone may be good. The same idea of Cyrus, maybe let the Jews go back to Palestine. 
you know, Kurosh, let this Kurosh go to Palestine to have a buffer against Egyptians. Maybe this was his idea, or maybe it was gen genuinely religious. We shouldn't always think people are not. Okay, after the, but, you know, this is the important part. First is Hassan al-Utrush. Utrush means deaf, you know, uh, but Hassan uh, Nasr al-Haq was his title. He tried to do some uprising first, and then just immediately after 287, he came over there. So, and then you will see, and then he tried to do some uprising. The uprising failed. Uh, and then he decided instead of going uprising, getting government, let's convert people, let's work on the people. And then he started to work not only people in Tabaristan, but maybe they were more Sunni, but moved to the Daylaman and Gilites, uh, Gilan and convert many of them to Islam and Zaydi Islam. I think this gave more support to him. And then he was successful to really uh, restored the government in 301. So he's 14 years doing activity and essentially converting people to Shi Islam and then get the control government. But the, he passed, uh, died relatively soon uh, at 304. So I'm not going through that. But as I remember last time we said, Tabari says the people had not seen anything like the justice of old Utrush, his good conduct and his full minute full min of the right. So that was the, what we saw. Uh, from him. But what I'm saying, the efforts were not in vain. You see here, every group comes, essentially come on the other group. For example, the Buyids, which I'm not going to go to there, they were present in his army, his, his core. So they, they, they trained here, they learned here, and then they get the control later on. I'm not going to go to Buyids today, maybe next lecture. Uh, we want to go to the back to the Ray. Again, I want you to focus on the Ray. Ray is a very uh, close to south of the, around, south of the mountains. Ghazvin is here. Uh, is another big city, and uh, these are two big cities and uh, with good agriculture. So we want to focus on Ray, and then you can see an axis, Shi axis can be developed. If Qom, Shi, Imami, and then here north is, is Shi, Zaidi, I think, and the transportation goes to the Ray, you anticipate some Shi elements developing Ray, but it's a little bit, his story is different. And then one other thing I want you to remember, the story, the story of each city is different. It's not all monolithic. Yeah, I mean, Chicago, we have a story. Although Chicago and New York may be similar, but, you know, difference, uh, US, we have more similarity, but here is very different. And that's what I want to emphasize, especially about Ray. Ray was an important prosperous city before Islam. And as I said, an important city for transportation, for going east and west on the Iranian plateau. It was conquered by Muslim army 23 after Hijrah. This is contrary to that, North Caspian Sea, which was never conquered and was kind of away the mainland, and home, which I think, as as if I judge by today, because of the weather or the condition, it it it, it wasn't that attractive. I, I'm not sure who decide why the Ash'aris go to home. Maybe that's is somewhere in the middle. Uh, nobody come pay attention much to it. Maybe good hiding place. But anyway, Ray is not like that. And then due to the strategic importance. After the way, some Arab tribes were from the beginning settled there and, and including a decent size of fighting units. Omar generally didn't allow the, all the fighting units to be spread. So the majority of the fighting unit was settled in Kufa and Basra. If there was any big fight, these guys have to go out and do the fight in the frontier. But then in the cities, you cannot leave empty without fighters. So you have gar smaller garrison cities, not as big as Kufa or elite as Kufa and Basra, but you have in Esfahan and you have in Nair Ray, and then they have their own administration. The administration of the east of Kufa was under the Kufa, uh, uh, and then Ray has its own administration, it was important. And then you you know the famous story that this, okay, that Omar the Sad which his army did at the atrocities of the Karbala, uh, was promised the governorship of Ray by Ibn Ziyad, who was governor of Kufa. So Caliph would install governor of Kufa, and the governor of Kufa could install the governor of the Ray. And Ray must be of some attractions, maybe the weather, prosperity, I, I don't know that Ibn Ziyad did that. But still remember, majority are non-Arabs, and the, during the Umayyad period, it is solidly pro-Omayyad because the governments were, were, were very, it was an important city for them. We have control on it. And the Arab city over them, they make sure it's loyal. 
And, and then, for example, in the time of Moavia, a governor was put over there by Kassir ibn Shahab, by whom, by Mughair ibn Shoba, governor of Ray. Now, this Mughair ibn Shoba, governor of Kufa, put Kassir ibn Shahab as governor of Ray. This Mughair ibn Shoba, first, is good to uh, just a pause on it. This Mughair ibn Shoba uh, uh, is the one which, when was young, Abu Lolo which the one uh, assassinated Omar worked for him. But so see, he's, you see him 40 years earlier and that story, which is a little bit suspicious. I have some idea, maybe this assassination was uh, Omayyad plots too, but anyway, he was very close to Moabia. When after the peace treaty with Imam Hassan, and Moabia captured Kufa, and Kufa, you know, is the important garrison city, uh, hot head people, rebellion. So you put somebody you trust, uh, somebody powerful. So Moabia, uh, Moabia put Moghair ibn Shoba, uh, which is from Saqif, uh, Ta'if, as the ruler of Kufa. So he was a trusted man. And then later on, you mean 12 years later after the peace treaty with Imam Hassan, you see after Imam Hassan Martyr, he's the one, he's the one proposed the uh, uh, successive successorship of Yazid. So he's orchestrated all the get collecting bay as all. I mean, start to say who's better than Yazid. Your uh, Mavia look at him. Oh, I'm sure, not sure. No, the game, the theater. But he's orchest orchestrating it. So this guy is, is now a simple guy. He's a, like, essentially is maybe after Amros, a second hand uh, man of the Mavia. Actually, I think Mavia like was more closer to him than Amroas. That's another story at the time of Ali. Uh, Amroas was in Egypt and anyway, another story. But, but the point is that, okay, now this guy put Kassir ibn Shahab and Kassir ibn Shahab, his story said, uh, he is somebody for himself. First, he's continuously used to curse the Imam Ali alayhi salam from the pulpit. So that when he was governor of, 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 of Ray. Then after Muawiyah, he went back to Kufa he is one of the people stayed with Ibn Ziyad and discouraged people joining Muslim. He is one of the people sent Kufas fighting against Imam Hussein. So you see this type of people were ruling in Ray. So the environment in the Ray, especially among the Arabs, uh, which uh, was then not much pro Ahl of Bayt and maybe pro Umayyad. Not much Shia there too, still at this stage. And we're talking about Umayyad period which is, as I said, 41 after Hijra, 232 after Hijra. Okay, so we do not have much Shias over there. Um, there is one report we have, one Shia wrote to the Imam, uh, and I don't know it's fifth Imam or sixth Imam, but he said, I don't find anybody to give zakat to, so whom I guess should give it to where I send it. There are some negative hadiths regarding people of Ray in our Shia collections. Uh, I think this category of hadiths are, uh, are, should be understood uh, carefully. I'm not, I think I, maybe I case occasion to discuss it a little bit. Not, I'm not going to do that. For example, one hadith says uh, people of Ray are hostile uh, with uh, uh, I, I don't read all of it. Let's read just this part because I don't want to go. Yaruna Harb al Ahlul Bayt, Rasulullah Jahaz. Okay? So th that's so they see the fighting prophet or family of prophet in jihad. Uh, another one, which I have to say some of this one, okay, we understand maybe, but another one which needs some interpretation says they, the belief doesn't enter the heart of the people of Ray. Okay. If you start to say this halal al Muhammad halal or haram al Muhammad halal and haram to the end of times, and you want to generalize this hadith, we end up with a not good situation, not reasonable situation, and very stigma on people of rape. So instead of too much generalizing it, you have to look at the situation right now. So uh, uh, the concept is it just is not a general universal history for all the times. It's just I'm saying the situation at that time. People at Ray at that time, at that time, fifth or sixth amount, were not receptive to the message of Ahlul Bayt. They're hostile. They are fighting with every uprising of Ahlul Bayt, stuff like that. Like now, if you go to Grand Rapids in Michigan, I'm not sure Chicago has that. They are very conservative. You go to 
uh, Montana, some other places. So there are, I'm not judging the conservative peoples do not necessarily have their support of former president, I mean, for, for non-president to be former president. So they maybe have good understanding of Islam. They're not very receptive of Muslim people, uh, or maybe, I'm not generalizing it. So we have to understand if we generalize this, uh, uh, Hadith is too much, we end up in wrong place, and which unfortunately we have done that. So I thought this is a good time to say, okay, but one interesting thing is that before the end of Umayyas, for a brief period, the control of rake fall in the hand of Abdullah ibn Mu'awiyyat ibn Abdullah ibn Jafar ibn Abi Talib, uh, the, the son of Jafar ibn Abi Talib. We discussed it in the first lecture. That uprising was important. By some weakness of Umayyas, he get the control of large area, but doesn't mean people become Shia. He just get the control of it. Uh, and then what we said, I emphasize, is mostly about Arabs. Few of the Ajam non-Arabs have converted to Islam. Majority of people are Zoroastrian. Now, what happens in the Abbasid area? The Abbasid area changes. Abu Muslim army conquered that, that, that uh, city on the way, conquering, defeating Umayyads. And Abu Muslim... Uh, they don't like the people of Ray, and people of Ray are scared from him. They're pro Umayyad. They all escaped. Abu, Abu Muslim take all their wealth, and then, then when they after Abbasid getting control, Safa getting control, people of Ray went to Safa say, "Look, Abu Muslim took all our money." Safa told them, "Give it back to them." Abu Muslim said, "These are very pro Umayyad against, uh, for example, Bani Hashim stuff like that." Safa uh, pushed him to pa pa give back the money, but so shows this anti pro Umayyad reputation was there, but things start to change. At the first level, you know, the cities which are the hub of trade or transportation, usually are prosperous, attracts scholars, attracts knowledgeable people. And it was a good knowledge center of Sunni scholarship. Lots of Hanbalis and Maliki Shafis. Gradually, she start to come to. Uh, and then maybe Zaydis come, and maybe Zaydis kind of hide their uh, Sunni, uh, Zaydism and mix with the Sunnis. And then we have uh, maybe from homecoming. The first, the first things we have heard, and is in Sunni books too. There are two narrators uh, uh, of hadith, Abdullah ibn Abdul Qudus. Maybe it was Shi'i, but Sunni is narrated from him. Ibn Ishaq, the writer of the famous writer of the Sira Prophet. They went to the went to the Ray and were living over there. And then I both were accused some Shi'i tendencies. Even Ibn Hisham edited Ibn Ishaq history, Sira Prophet, and say, oh, this is too much Shi'i, take some Shi'i stuff out, which is not, per se, it's truth. And when you look at it, it's, 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 it's even as much less than the Shi'i thing should be, but still there are some remnants. So you see, and then one of the things started in Abbasid area, at, 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 at least you could talk about the virtues of family of the Prophet. I mean, maybe you don't look them as Imam, but at least they were Ahl uh, The virtues start to spread instead of cursing. You start to do that. So this start to go through. They hear it, the, the scholars came, but then we, we still do not have any evidence of contact with the Imams till late second century. And, and the first one we have is a letter uh, uh, with communication, a hadith narrated, which is she living in the Ray has uh, to the seventh Imam. And then one of the things also we noticed by this time, relatively through the Abbasid governments and by the race of Iranians and the race of Shiism in Baghdad and other places, we have as administrators of Abbasid administrators, people who are by heart Shi'i or by the Taqiyya, they're hiding it and they are help the other Shi'is. Similar, the famous story of Ali ibn Yaqteen, which was the companion of the seven and eight Imam. This next hadith is interesting. I put the whole Farsi over there. I, I translate it for you. Uh, it's in Bahar al -Anwar. So this is, you see, so the connection from Ahl al comes true. Uh, the story says, one of the people of Ray says, one of the Munshis, uh, uh, you know, scribes of uh, Yahya Khalid al-Barmaki becomes the governor of Ray. And then he said, I had some money to pay to the government. And I was worried that, that uh, maybe because I couldn't pay tax, they take my property out of my hand, like the houses here. Uh, and then, but somebody told him, so that means there were Shias now, by the end of uh, 50 years after Umayyads, uh, there are some Shias in Ray. And somebody has told him, uh, this governor is really Shia. Go go tell him 
what's the situ situation is helping helping you. But I was scared, you know, I go to the governor and then open my hand and then what happens to me? So me still, the whole environment is not very friendly to Shias. But then he decided to do something else, to go to Hajj and from there go to visit Imam Musayi Qasem. At that time, sometimes the, uh, the, the name they used for Imam Musayi Qasem was Sabr. I mean, Qasem and Sabr are close. Uh, so, and then I told him, look, this is my situation. Imam wrote a letter and then said to me, go to the governor of Ray. So meaning that rumor was right. And the letter was this, uh, know that, that under the heaven of the uh, uh, God, uh, uh, there is a shadow. Uh, nobody can rest underneath except the... Uh, 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 somebody helps his brother. I mean, I mean, simple. The only way to save yourself to have a rest and peace, you need to serve your uh, your dear uh, Muslim or Shi brother, and then helping him to remove some obstacle out of their way. So that's also the mosques are for. That's as the mosque have blessings to, to know somebody has some problem. You need to help them financially, health wise, otherwise, uh, family wise. This is the one. If you can do that. Uh, you are safe next next world and even this world. And and or bring happiness to their heart. And then Imam says, this guy who brings the letter is your brother. Uh, I mean, sorry, my translation wasn't perfect, but I think many of you can read Farsi and I, I think and I'll give you the story. And that person says, okay, I returned to the city. I went to the governor and I, I said, look, I'm coming here and Sadr alayhi salam has sent me. The, the governor, when heard it, ran, ran without shoes. This, this is a governor, this is an ordinary man. And hugged me and kissed me, uh, my eyes, and then asked me, oh, tell me, tell me what you, you saw, Imam. And, and I explained for him uh, and give the letter and he got happy and take me to house, put me at the top of the uh, room and uh, and then again, kissed it and read it, kiss the letter, read it and, and told to give me, give me uh, money, dress, clothes and, uh, and, 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 and gold coins. And then he give me one by one. Like, you know, when you buy a gift, some child want to show you, oh, I got this, I got this. So he was excited showing one by one, you know, the governors don't do that. And then he was asking because of that had this, oh, oh, my brother, are you satisfied from me? Are you happy from me? And then I would say, yes, yes, by God, I'm happy. And then he called the, 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 uh, the official documents, I forgot the, the dafater, and then uh, the one who written the whole, well, how much tax this owes, this guy has, and cleaned it, uh, erased it. Uh, and then I uh, and then I wrote back to the imam, told imam how this government acted. Me. But unfortunately, uh, uh, this comment from Ahmed Jaffer says they didn't mention the name of governor, so we don't know him exactly who is. I'm not sure whether we can find from other history books, but anyway. So and then now we see things start to change. Uh, we see few of the companions. This is again the connection to the imams have the nickname Razi. Razi means from name. Um, uh, later on, all the imams, seven, eight, nine, tenth imam, have companions named Razi. I'm not sure about the eleventh imam is possible because he was in Samera, wasn't as much. Totally, twenty five narrators of hadith with Razi name are in the main four hadith Shi collection books. So they have narrator hadiths which are Razi, and there could be other people from Ray and not having the Razi nickname added to them. So we have that in mind too. So uh, we are near the end. It's, I think it takes about five minutes. Uh, and then, uh, so you see these people of Ray start to become influential. Uh, although the real influence and the real importance starts after this lecture, by the race of Buits and they become a center of a uh, very cosmopolitan center of knowledge, uh, Shi, Zaidi, Motazari. But let's finish this story. The important turning point for Shiism is the coming of Abdullah Azim al Hassani, the one we saw shrine to that city. They, some books say it's ordered by Tentamam, it could be, or sometimes he came himself. It's very po possible, honestly. The Ash'ari is going to Qom. I don't understand how they choose Qom. Maybe because uh, maybe they knew, but I think they went over there before Bibi Masume, the sister of uh, Hazrat Masume, Imam, uh, uh, 
uh, brother of Amr Zago over there. But here, okay, uh, they, they went to uh, uh, Ray. But you look, the Ray was Hastani environment. Actually, it seems Abdul Azim Hastani has escaped from Tabaristan. So again, you see the connection. He was a Shi'i in Tabaristan. But when the Tabaristan situation went worse and get the control on the Samanis or Sunni, uh, militant Sunnis, he escaped to Ray. And then he hidden himself in the quarter of Mavali, Iranis. And then he was hiding in a Shia friend house and just fasting all day and during the night just praying. And then he tried to put himself close to the burial place of one of the descendants of Imam Musa ibn Jafar, Hamza ibn Musa. So that's one reason maybe he's there. And then we know by the uh, by the coming, which we haven't discussed, Imam Reza to Iran, many son, children of Imam Musa caused them come to Iran. And some of them did, did uprising. So for whatever reason, and that Hamza ibn Musa was passed away and buried in Ray, and it is uh, Abdul Aziz Hassani, which was Hassani, by a few generations away from Imam Hassan. So he wasn't directly a son of any Imam, but he was doing praying, fasting, and then he buried there, and then there were recommendations by the 10th Imam. He must die by 252. He was born in 173 after Hijrah. But they think he migrated a couple of years, he's passing away. So maybe it was an intention he died away, honestly, over there. He buried over there. He was a pious man. We have hadiths from imams. Go visit his shrine at this. I mean, <clears throat> I think, I, I believe these ones are true. And, and then that attracted many Shias. <clears throat> and then the, really, they come settled down. The whole Ray is a better place, maybe from financially business like Chicago is better than any other places. And, and then the last part, which I don't want to go through there, is this. Still, still is a hostile environment, or at least it's not too friendly with Shia. Shias are coming, settling down in the neighborhoods. Uh, but there is a change <clears throat> which uh, by a person called... Abul Hassan Ahmed ibn Hassan al Madr Madr Madrani. <clears throat> he must be from Kermanshah. There were some debates where he said he was in the armies which are fighting around their local kings. I, I cannot go through that. Ziyarids, you know, one of the national local dynasties. But there is a hadith which is interesting. And this has come in coffee. So I finish with this again, people want about how this he becomes Shia. The question was that he he become the ruler of Ray. So this is besides that brief period, Abdullah ibn Jafar, uh, I mean, the son of Jafar ibn Abi Talib, the grandchildren, become a ruler for a short time. Uh, but that was in Omaya time, he couldn't do much. This is the first time with some Shis in the city, a, a person with Shi inclinations get the political power of the city. And I think this, this says the fortune change. As I told you, big changes in the religious population always have some political impetus in it. Even in Europe, you know, Protestantism or conversion of the Byzantine Empire, if Constantinople hasn't converted to Christianity, uh, the Christianity will become ma major religion. Now, I finish with this hadith. This hadith, the narration in Kafi has some vagueness. Uh, Ali Jafarian says the narration in Ibn Tawus makes it a little bit more vagueness goes away. And there are some dispute with this Madrani person was a Shia early or then later become Shia. The hadith says maybe later on, but the story is this. At this Kulaini says, and narrate the story from the, the, the servant, the Qulam. Uh, uh, and then you have to be careful. This is Qulam narrating from the, 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 the Madrani himself. People sometimes confuse the Qulam is talking. No, Qulam is talking from the mouth. So the, this Madrani, which become ruler, Hassan Madrani, which become ruler of race says, when, when I got to the mountains, that he started to go conquesting around, you know, with the Ziyari king. Uh, I didn't believe in Imamat, if we accept that. But I love Ahlul Bayt. So I was, it was a Sunni, not hostile, not Nasibi, but wasn't she. Ta'inke, in one of the wars, which on the rival, the kid, yes, he did kill, yes, he did not Abdullah die. It was uh, the rival, they're fighting. And then, uh, and then he says, that's interesting, that that guy, I don't know how this happened. Uh, uh, he gave me the wasiyat that give me the horse, uh, give the horse, the sword, and all stuff to uh, Molayash. And this time is Gaivat uh, Kobra. 
Uh, no, Gaybat Sobra, sorry, Gaybat Sobra. Uh, so it's, be, it's 290, Gaybat Sobra started 260 to 329. And it means this, this is, if it's true, as one of the connections or contacts with uh, somehow with the Shi follower with the uh, 12th Imam in the Nahi and uh, So that, but you know, this guy, this Madrani was working uh, with the Turkish commander, which he put him on Ray. And then it seems that Turkish commander wanted the horse and the sword of this Abdullah Yazid ibn Abdullah. So I was scared if I directly give them and take them to, for example, to, ba uh, to Baghdad or give it or, or to, uh, and give it to the Nahiya Magadassi, this will not be good. But then I said to myself, I will pay the money. And then Okay, so I, I sit down, but after a while, a letter from Iraq on my hand. You know, this is a miracle part, which he didn't tell anybody. He scared to give directly the sword and other stuff because the, his, his overlord may be asking, where are they? So, but the worth of it is 700 dinar, seven gold, 700 gold coins. So, and then, uh, uh, then what happens is this, uh, uh, he went to the one of the naibs of uh, Imam Zaman. Uh, I don't know how he contacted them. Uh, and uh, okay, it seems he give to one of the representative, not directly to, to the naibs, because he gives to Abul Hassan al-Assadi, which who was the Vakin in Ray. Not, of the four, not, not one of the four naibs, but the representative of those. And, and uh, uh, they, but not, uh, he got another letter that give that maybe not the price has increased thousand dinar uh, give to the so maybe the discrepancy was seven hundred thousand between the two hadiths there so I wrap it up is this at the end this person which intended to give this somehow following the vasi of the other guy give this sword and other stuff to to somehow to Imam asked. Uh, give it to the representative of the Ray, but they initiated, and and the end. Madrani says, "Man, this I I, I uh, praise, I thank God because I knew nobody except me know this. So this is kind of miracle. I mean, this could be true. Honestly, look, we have to be not too much uh, playing the rational game. I think if God wants to intervene, does with this kind of guys because what like, this simple miracle, this guy is, is really hard and solid." And then he has very big influence in Ray. I'm not going to go to that detail. So I, it's, it's in Kolaini. I mean, I, I, I mean, even I'm saying because some of these stories we have to check. Not every story is true, but I think Kolaini and then this type of story, I think is to making that guy truly become Shia. So this is the first part of the Shi'is and Ray. The second part is interesting, intellectually interesting, important for the whole history of Shia intellectual. Uh, history. So, inshallah, if we have, uh, we'll do it uh, another time, next time, and then I finish it with the Salawat al Imam Alayhi Salam. Allahumma salli ala Ali ibn Musa al Murtaza al Imam al Tabi al Nadir. Wa hujjatika ala man falda al Azam taht al Sara al Sadiq al Shahid. Salatan kasiratan, tamatan, zakiyatan, mutawasilatan, mutawatratan, mutaradifatan, kafsalu, wa sallaytu ala ahadin min awliyai. Salawat al Khamsa. Oh. Dear brother Qudusi, uh, thank you very much for your like long and informative lecture. It was very helpful for me at least. And uh, uh, let's go cover all the questions. Mr. Dr. Atoyi just sent me a, that he has uh, he has a question. Let's start with him. And after that, please just uh, let me know or raise your hand over the chat if you have any question. Uh, Dr. Atay, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters. Um, Dr. Qudusi, thank you so much for uh, these informative lecture series. And my apologies that I'm speaking a little bit um, with a lower voice. Uh, we have small kids at home and they are sleeping, so uh, my apologies. I have two questions for you. Sure, um, sure. One is, and feel free to answer in any order. Uh, one is that you compare the spread of Islam in Iran with, uh, with the communities that we have in the US and the spread of Islam in this country. However, I was thinking while you were speaking that 
maybe this comparison would be a better comparison if you compare the spread of Islam in Malaysia or Indonesia or Brunei for that matter compared to the spread of Islam in Iran. Because in Iran, we had rulers who were Muslim and so it has a huge impact on people converting to Islam. And also we had higher taxation on people who were non-Muslims like property taxes or other kinds of taxes versus we didn't have these cases in Malaysia um, and it was by community after community who converted to Islam and then uh, we have a majority of Muslims in that country. So I would appreciate to know your insights uh, and comments on that. My second question to you, doctor, is um, I was wondering what is the relation between the Zaydis in Tabaristan and uh, the government in Yemen? Could it be because the, Yem uh, the Yemeni governorate uh, before Islam was the stronghold and the capital of the governorate of the imperial Iran in the Arabian Peninsula. And this was because I was studying the letter that Khosrow Parviz wrote to Prophet Muhammad, and he, this letter came um, to, to, to Medina from the Yemen. So that was the letter that he wrote to the Yemen uh, Hakim and the Yemeni governor um, actually wrote that, sent that letter to, to, to our prophet. So I appreciate knowing your comments on this. Thank you so much. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Atari. Thank you, Nurse. Uh, uh, Mr. Regarding Malaysia and Indonesia, uh, yeah, that's a very good example, maybe better. I was aware the example I'm giving is not perfect and even more than Muslim, maybe Shia Islam, but I wanted the people here relate. So uh, so I know there are mostly Iranians or at least they, uh, they are from Pakistan or Afghanistan, the, uh, Iraq, they, the communities, they understand the situation between their home community and here. But yes, your example is, is much better. Even in some aspects, the spread of Christianity too in, in Byzantine Empire. But the example you give Malaysia, Bruni, uh, Indonesia is perfect. And, and I think just I want to, yeah, for at least we can say maybe not the whole Islam, even Shi Islam. Gradually, you see it's uh, one mosque this city, the other mosque this city, one, but we have Rome, we have Tabarasan. So the example is very good, better, and very interesting. And I think uh, one of the other problems I think we have, we, uh, we do not have, you, you, it seems, we do not have generally good knowledge about that. Uh, Malaysian, Indonesian, and Brunei Islam, which which is a huge percentage of Muslim world, and actually by the success Malaysia, Indonesia show maybe they were the most advanced soon Islamic countries and and reasonable because Turkey was, but I think with the Erdogan, I'm not sure how things are go going. Uh, but the other point is 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 you said look, in one sense those factors have effect. Yes, you're right. Those now look as kind of I maybe mentioned it even the first lecture. There were some Iranians directly ruling uh, Yemen after the uh, that uh, uh, Abraham stuff like that, and then some they intermarry with the Arab local population, and they, the children were called Abna, so they were mixed mixed uh, races. They converted very fast, and they were ruler to Islam. And exactly that, you know, when the Khosrow Parvi's letter came, I mean, when the uh, the son of Khosrow Parvi, uh, Khosrow Parvi sent to arrest Prophet Muhammad, but they, they, when they come over there, the Prophet told them, wait for it one day, and the morning, let them know, look, uh, Khosrow Parvi was assassinated, and then when they check, they hear the news, they converted. So they have some sincere, it's some some uh, inclination here. But the more important one is the Arab Yemeni tribes, uh, conversion in the hand of the uh, Hazrat Ali Ali Salam. That's the big one uh, because uh, the Prophet sent Khaled. Khaled was very tough. They said we will fight, and there were big tribes. We don't fight, but Imam Ali went over the without fight. We, we just by talking converted them. That's the hope of Ahlul Bayt was there. There is other other things over there too. You know that my, all those big companions of Imam Ali are Yemenis. Uh, I, I said this Hamdan, which who sees are from, and all uh, Nakhai, Malik, Ashtar, all, all, all are what uh, are Yemenis. So <clears throat> one of the reasons also when when the Yemeni tribes influenced in the Futuhat race, then Omar was forced to put Imam Ali back into consul because they start to ask where is Ali. Like is it was a commander, they know about him and so very see. So the the that's that's Omar cannot do much now because the Yemeni tribe have moved. 
and now there are all the conquests. So that's the real uh, stronghold. But one of the interesting things is the geography too. Look, Tabaristan has mountains, Sa'da, which is Usis, are there is mountains. And then they, they, they're, that's if you hold, you establish a government, you can hold it. And then there were connections we kind of discussed. The one who established uh, uh, the government in Yemen came to Tabaristan and look what's going on in the Zaidi government in Tabaristan. He liked some things, he didn't like some things. And then he went down in Yemen, established his government. Some people from Tabaristan start to go uh, down there to support him, you know, they because they thought he's the more righteous Imam that the two brothers which established the government in Tabaristan. Uh, and then so, you know, they all, the names were Dai da his name is Hadi al Haq, the one who established the government in Yemen was Hadi al Haq, and he's one of the big Imams. And then the, the one other thing related to uh, to Ray, which actually Aray Ansari was saying it on Tuesday, look, Unfortunately, we will see, maybe I'm giving up my one of my interesting stories for the next time. Much of the Shia knowledge in Yemen was burned by the Sunni conquerors later on, by Saljuq, Turks, and other ones. Much of the Zaid, Shi'i, uh, Mami, Zaidi, and even Mu'tazili. But the, the only luck we partially have, some of the Yemenis came to, to uh, Ray and copied them. And then those copies survived in Yemen. Yemen is one of the best place for survival of all these copies, Quran, other stuff. So the connections uh, are, are in that way, the Yemeni tribes are the most loyal supporters of Imam Ali. There are other reasons, tribal reasons too, uh, especially those converted. They have, and even you remember, even they, they suggested to Imam Hussein, why, why you go to Kufa, go to Yemen? Because Yemen is a stronghold, like like you know Iran, you know uh, you know like Fadai, you know those communist guerrilla groups. They went to Siaka, you know the junk like Daylaman was impenetrable. The same Sada is impenetrable uh, because of the mountains stuff like that. There are various too. So these connections are there. So you see all, because, all the mixtures. Could it be because um, like Yemen um, back before back in the day before Islam? Um, Yemen was part of the Iranian Empire, and they had like relations. Could it be the reason, or or I am off in oh, assuming? No, this. that's not interesting. I was thinking a little bit. Uh, yeah, that that, that because could... Oman, Oman, and Yemen, they were part uh, of the Iranian Empire. Yeah. You let me give the, your answer in another way. Yeah, I, 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 to this, I have to be specific. Yeah, you know what you say is like this. Why this dear bone become fully Shia? Because in 1920s. The uh, Ford Motor Company, and I give you the Khurasan example too. Ford Motor Company wants workers, so allowed Lebanese, which were not a good condition, coming here. Many come to even to Canada, come to here, so they settled down here. This is the first generation Lebanese settling down in Dearborn to Ford Ford factory. But in 1980s, when Israeli Israel invaded South Lebanon and American let the Lebanese immigrate, they say, "Oh, I have cousins so so in in, in Dearborn or or Detroit, so let me come here." That, That's so usually they, the case. They they immigrate to the to the place that they have communities there. Yeah. Okay, and then to support you in one other direction, there is a huge uh, gr uh, tribal group called Azd, Az uh, Azad. Okay, I think it's some people, Az Azad, let's call it Azad. Uh, this tribal group is huge and they're Yemenis. They live in Oman too, they leave, and then some of these other groups are sub-branch of it. Azad, in the time of Sasani, some of them were forced to move inside Iran. For whatever reason, I don't remember what, yeah, you remember you said Hassanis ruled uh, Yemen and Oman. Yep. From yep. there, some were forced to move to Khorasan. I don't know what to do something, control something, subdue them, because some of the kings moves the courts or, or Qashqais, all, all Turks all around Iran. I mean, I mean, I'm, and so we go from, uh, from I mean, but uh, 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 Sassanis did that. And then this Azad tribe in the time of late Omayyads, many of them immigrated to Khorasan. And actually could, that could be a reason, cousin so-so or the grandfather so-so was there. And the Azad tribe, which, you know, this some of Azad, the story of, uh, look, the Imam Ali, uh, Serial or movie or Mukhtar, they are, they are there. For example, Abu Maknaf is Azdi. So, and then they were very important in the downfall of Omayyads. So, it's possible they were more familiar with the Persian custom. But the what I'm going to say is this 
I agree this factor could be, I have to be specific, but much more immigration. You know, so all the Arabs now uh, were familiar, besides those Yemenis, Abna, with Sasa, now much of the Arabs go to Iran, come back. Even look, every Kufa had to go to fights in uh, Marv, uh, Nah, you know, talking to yourself, Uzbekistan, do the yeah. fights and come back. So yeah. more or less all the Arabs, in look, for example, uh, uh, Ibn Saad, uh, 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 he wants to be governor of Ray, so he must have some understanding what kind of place Ray yes. is. So, so combination. But thank you. That was a good idea. Maybe more direct search will come. Thank you so much. And again, I, I really enjoy these lecture series of yours. Thank you thank so you. much. Very kind of you. Thank, thank you. you. Pleasure. Thank you. You're yeah, it was interesting even for me that the Yemen was part of Sasani's empire. I just googled it and. Uh, dropped a link in the chat if anyone wants interested yeah, I in. I okay. Uh, was... Yeah. I have Ms. Opportunity. Yes, uh, yes, Mr. Yeah. Ardehali. And we'll be after right. Mr. Aldehali, we'll be with Mr. Zuhair. Okay. Uh, I, Dr. Odusi, show me a graph. رپرزنت کردین من البته برای روشن شدن مطلب میخوام یه کرف در واقع بله بله. اونجا در وسط کرف این شافعی رو و همبلی رو ذکر کردین آیا این وفخ میده با زمانی که حضرت امام جعفر صادق صلی الله علیه و آله و سلم درس میدادن با اون زمان وفخ میده اون کرو رو بیارین این جن همونی که جن... the one shows the conversion جن... yeah. کر... وسط کر بود یک قسمتی آه... آه بله emerges of همبلی شد بله بله ببینید emerges even is later look امام جعفر ساده passed away 148 you see here 148 just the beginning and then شافی and then همبلی is one of the latest one of the four and then همبلیز are همبلی is the time of مامون you know مامون yeah, 2025. And then emergence means this got the power. What happens is that Mahmoud did Mahmoud start to persecute Hanbalis, but the Mutavakil when come after Mahmoud turns around. That's an interesting story in the time of Mahmoud. Maybe I have to say it one other lecture. And then Hanbalis and Shafis get more power. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, به اصطلاح یه مکتبی که فا دنبال کردین اما یه چیزی بگم یک کمال آقای مدلانگ ولی خب یه قسمت هم مال آقای جعفریان رو باید یعنی به همین صورتی که من نوشتم آوردم نیست یه حد شما گزینش کنید یعنی من یه سبک دیگه رفتم جلو بیشتر شاید اون دو تا لکچر اولم واقعا تحت تاثیر آقای مدلان بودم ولی یه سری مدلان رو میخوندم بعد میرفتم نکات اضافه رو از آقای جعفریان در میوردم این دفعه یه مکسچری شده یعنی خب خودم هم مثلا یه خود ترتیب رو به هم زدم الان میبینید آقای جعفریان تا قم به قم میره همه شهرها رو کران هم بررسی میکنه من به جایی که برم اونجوری دو سه تا شهر رو برداشتم دیگه نمیخوام برم کاشان و اسفان اینا اونا هم جالبه اسفان خوصا جالب ولی آنستی اما کتاب آقای جعفر اینا you have to find is a little bit overwhelming there are too much details and, and that's the skill of reading too not me i know i over only with details last lecture more than i thought the first lecture i thought okay is i have to go fast uh, but then i noticed it was more i could take it out this time i tried to take it out but Alai Jafarian book is huge. You have to find a way which part you read fast, which part, okay, go detail. But honestly, this is a great work, but he did it when he's young. Now I think he could do, people can go beyond that. Miss Dr. Professor Maddon is reversed. It's only 11 pages. I mean, it's a book 120, 30, all really from 
Mazdaqi gerefte taught um, everything. Is there a smiley, everything. Is Imam Zaidi has only 11 page, but really that uh, doesn't have any extra work. There are references, and if, and, and as, as, actually I really believe Wikipedia is good to start. Honestly, my professional work, if I don't even know, I'm honestly saying people in there, I don't know, because I've switched from physics and engineering to neuroscience stuff, and very, some biology sometimes, I don't know. I start from Wikipedia, get the basic idea, go to the, okay, the main articles, or I search. So, but uh, yeah, still this book is the best. If you, I mean, just, if, if you just, but notice there are many details which nobody can absorb it, if you get skip on it and going through it and get the main part, somebody should summarize this book. So how, so, how many pages is it, Mr. Jafarian's? Just to, because we want to wrap up this question to move on to it's the other. It's 950 page. 950. Okay, 954, Mr. Rasul Jafarian and Dr. Madeline, Professor Madeline, or 100, you said, yep. No, no even, even less, but Madeline doesn't cover all the things. Okay. Still this, uh, me, one other thing Jatharian has done, even quoted Madeline, you know? The good thing is that it's, it's, it's old style of the, like, Tabari. They get all references, they quote them. But he hasn't, he has tried to harmonize them, but sometimes he noticed it's not to harmonize just, you have, he actually, he has the Farsi translation of Madeline article, which I didn't have. He quoted inside the book. So you suddenly you say, oh, this paragraph is from Madeline. I think it's, this book is the best, but just when you read it, notice it. There are many details you may want to skip. And if you get that habit of reading, this good book is rewarded. So we are getting notice that we are running out of time. Sorry. Let's go to Mr. Zohair. Uh, please speak up and your, ask your question. Mr. Zuri, if you have it. Salaamu alaikum. Salaamu alaikum. Uh, Dr. Kudusi, I have a question about Abu Lu'a. You mentioned it very yes. quickly. Yes. Um, can you please tell me what your theory is quickly on, about Abu Lu'a and the assassination of Omar bin al-Khattab? I didn't catch it. Yeah, you, you catch. The, yeah, I noticed I was very brief. Actually, that's worth it. Look, uh, there are. So by the way, we have like a general audience here, <laughs> not specifically Shia. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not actually, it, it maybe this actually for, for uh, uh, bring Shia and Sunni closer together. Look, Allama Askeri. Actually, he was the alim from Iraq, and many uh, he lived in Samarra. Many Sunnis like him. Look, he believes Umayyads, uh, Omar. Look, we have criticism of Omar, okay, for some reasons. But Omar, at least uh, financially, I mean, there, there are some corruption by him. But at least what he did is like this. Actually, Aray Firahi, which passed in Iran recently, uh, he had a good talk about this. Look, Omar, what he did is this. When the conquest happens, when the money are from the conquest come to the, uh, to the uh, 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 treasury, he paid the money to the people, distributed by some uh, regulation. But he doesn't let changing their wealth to capital. He doesn't let these guys go buy lands. He doesn't let them to, look, you make, if you have money in the bank is useless uh, in the sense, many of us just, but those who make a stock and or capital investment are billionaires, stuff like that. He, he doesn't want let them to be very rich. So he doesn't let them, they get money, look, uh, for example, uh, Talha or any, any, any of these companions get. Oh my, I don't, I don't, they were not happy with his policy. The theory is this, the assassination of Omar maybe was instigated by the Umayyads themselves. Because although I know the theory is that Medina was forbidden for Mawali, so Abu Lola couldn't go to Medina. Muqayr ibn Shoba get, because he was known young and wealthy, got a special permission for Abu Lola. Because Abu Lola was very good handyman. He can do carpentry, everything. He was, it was work, everything, gardening, everything. So, and then the story says he, Abu Mughayra, yeah, I wasn't good man. It, this part may be true. He forced him to do a lot of things, too much work, like a slave, not compensating much. And he go complain to Omar. Omar didn't respond very well. And then he decided to assassinate Omar. But the question is that why he didn't kill Abu Lola? If especially, why did he kill Mughayra himself first? Killing Mughayra, then killing Omar. Or, or, and then how he escaped. So, one theory which I'm very shortening, but if you want to find Allama Askari, he's very knowledgeable, honestly, and he's 
absolutely one of the ulama shi with tabrib stuff like that he thinks this could be an inside job of umayyad there are question about this theory uh, because how they would show who would be the next guy how they they should attack umar he doesn't die but uh, he decides he's next guy but anyway you will see maybe umar policy become too restrictive for them to accumulate wealth. But this happened, not by the assassination of the Omar, Osman removed the restriction. The rulership of Omar was aristocracy of Quraysh and Sarif overall, but now transferred only to Umayyads. That's, you see, Talha Zubar Aisha were against Osman, even Abra As. Nobody liked Osman, because even Abra As is partially Umayyad. This, this, uh, Osman, this changed the policy uh, it led hoarding lots of money. These companions become absolutely rich in the 13 years of Osman. They were not as rich in the 12 years of uh, Omar and Abu Bakr, whatever, Futuhat, stuff like that. So maybe I stopped the, yeah. So the point, the point, uh, the theory is that this may be an assassination by the Umayyads because get the completely the control of empire will fall in the hand of Umayyad. I mean, Osman, I mean, some guy even conceded Osman, uh, beginning of Khalaf and Osman, the beginning of Umayyad dynasty. We usually make it by Mahabia 41, but some people think in 22, 23 is really like that. This theory have details. Don't don't think I'm just get the, uh, Allah Askari knows the relationship, knows the marriages, who's who, who's doing what, and who comes to power. And then uh, Osman only appoint from Umayyad family after that. Uh, okay. And so that's it here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just a very quick follow-up question sure. to that. Is Abu Lu'la uh, revered by the Iranians and Shias as a hero? Okay. That's a good, uh, Look, look. That's I personally... No, 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 I get the answer. Okay. No, 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 no. I don't, and I personally, I never... Look, there has been, before revolution, some some circles did it. And, and But I think this is extremist, like you have anti-Nasibis, anti shias too. And in Iran, after revolution, not, no, this officially was banned. People really, you don't see any uh, uh, celebration of him. But recently, there are some quarters. I haven't say per se Abu Lolo, but uh, you can feel that those extremist quarters, which uh, you see in Iraq, maybe, and Iran, uh, which uh, even in London, London, yeah, 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 you said, yeah, they are pushing that line, and that line uh, is not what I, uh, I mean, even I see, for example, honestly, in never in Iran, the 40 years after the revolution, I go to any ceremony, somebody happy or celebrate. I'm honest, the the the, the, the assassination of Omar one time, United States, I was invited somewhere. I wasn't told what I'm, why I'm invited. I thought it's just fun. And then I noticed something's going on. I started asking, what, oh, guys, what's happening here? But honestly, so I'll be honest with you. But this is, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it's not part of Shia belief. It's not essential Shia belief and it's not supported by uh, Iranian government of Maraja. But there are very ultra Orthodox conservative circles, which maybe, as he said, some also have a connection in England pushing for it. Okay, but, uh, I'm I'm sorry, Dr. Hadavi, we couldn't cover your question. Maybe later next session we we get your question answered. Thank you, everybody, Dr. Kodusi. Thank you for all your effort and uh, lectures. Uh, we're gonna continue from now on, and from we're gonna stop here. And thank you, everybody. God bless everyone. May Allah accept all our prayers, and see you next time. Thank you. Sure. Allahumma kul valiye al hujjat ibn al hasan salawatuk.